let's turn in our Bibles now to Matthew chapter 19. The title of my message is Hope for Hurting Marriages. I heard a story about a fourth grade Sunday school teacher who was doing a talk on marriage. So she turned to her class and said, kids, does anyone know what the Bible says about marriage? One little boy raised his hand. Seems like it's always a little boy. And he says, yes, the scripture I'm thinking of is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> now, judging by the way a lot of marriages go these days, you can almost understand why he would say that. I've often said marriage is like a three-ring circus, uh, engagement ring, wedding ring, and suffering. In fact, it was Oscar Wilde that said, and I quote, the world has grown suspicious of anything that looks like a happily married life. End quote. J. Paul Getty, one of the richest men who ever lived, said, quote, I would give my entire fortune for one happy marriage. He had five of them. Apparently none of them were ever happy. So a happy marriage, is that even possible? Can a man and a woman fall in love like they do in the fairy tales and live happily ever after? Well, with the divorce rate where it's at today, one wonders. It's somewhere around 50%, give or take a couple of points, and, and it continues to rise. The more times you're married, the higher the percentages are that you will get divorced. Uh, if you've been married a second time, your divorce uh, rate could be at 60%. And for a third marriage, it rises even higher to 73%. But the title of my message is not No Hope for Hurting Marriages. It's Hope for Hurting Marriages. Maybe as you're listening to this message right now, your marriage is in big trouble. It's hanging by a thread, and the thread is on fire. You're even considering divorce. You've given up. But I want to offer hope from the Word of God. So back to that earlier question. Is it possible to have a happy and fulfilling marriage? I believe the answer is a resounding yes. Quick product promotion. I wrote a book called Mary <laughs> Happily. And my wife and I are on the cover because we're married happily. It can be done. And if it wasn't true, I wouldn't tell you it was true. So I want you to experience that as well. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that, that there's a marriage that has no problems or won't face challenges. Every marriage comes under pressures and difficulties and hardships. But I do believe it is possible to have a very fulfilling marriage if you do it right. And I think I can speak with some experience on this topic for three reasons. Number one, I've been up close and personal with divorce. I myself have never been divorced. But my mother was married and divorced seven times. Don't tell me it doesn't affect the kids. Anyone who says that has never had parents who divorced. I know how it affected me. It was devastating. And so I've seen what divorce can do. In fact, that very thing caused me to have a greater determination to find the right girl and have a successful marriage personally. The second reason I think I can address this topic is because I've been married now for 37 years. And I'm thankful to God for that. And we give the Lord the glory for that. And I, I tell you, when you look at my wife, you think she doesn't even look like she's 37 years old. But uh, it's hard to believe, 37 years. And thirdly, I've been counseling people with marital problems for almost 40 years now. I've pretty much heard and seen it all. And let me say this at the beginning. I believe that most of the divorces that have happened did not need to happen. Now there are exceptions to that and we will grant that, but I'm just saying most of them did not have to happen. I've seen marriages in the worst shape imaginable be put back together. So when someone comes into me for counseling, I'll often ask them a few questions. I'll start with, are you guys both Christians? And almost always they'll answer, oh yes, we're Christians and that's why we're here to see you. And so then I'll ask them, well, let me ask you, do you believe that the Bible is the Word of God? And, and they'll say, oh yes, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We love the Word of God. Now, third question, are you willing to do what the Bible says even if you find it difficult? Now, well, now they know they're in trouble 
and they, they want to say yes, but they kind of have a sense as to where I'm going. Quite frankly, if they cannot answer yes to all three of those questions, the conversation is effectively over. Oh, I know, you're going to say our situation is different, Greg. You don't understand. But you know what? The fact of the matter is, your situation probably isn't different. It's just the same problems that other people are facing. So here's what we need to consider. We need a biblical worldview on marriage. In other words, we need to think about this biblically, not emotionally. And we t can't take our cues from culture. What does culture know about marriage? What does Hollywood know about marriage? These people can't keep anything together. I mean, I, I don't want to pick on her, but Kim Kardashian's wedding is a classic example. I mean, how can I not acknowledge it? It cost $10 million. And I think my wedding cost like eight bucks or something. <laughs> it's a long time ago. It was watched by four million TV viewers, but it lasted 72 days. Seems like if a marriage goes that long or that short, I should say, everyone should get their gifts back again, you know? Uh, but that's not the only short Hollywood marriage we, in the news uh, of late is Katy Perry and Russell Brand uh, are divorcing after 14 months together. Kid Rock and Pamela Anderson were married. Did you even know that? They lasted four months. Renee Zellweger and Kenny Chesney lasted four months. Eddie Mercy and Tracy Edmonds lasted two weeks. Carmen Electra and Dennis Rodman lasted six days. I'm not making this up. Uh, singer Sinead O'Connor just ended her fourth marriage after 16 days. So I don't know about you, but I'm not looking to pop stars or movie stars or secular culture to tell me how to have a successful marriage. I'm going to go to an authoritative source, and that is the Word of God. That's the only way we can pull this off. We need God's help. Right? Now prior to getting married, Kathy and I Court it for three years. That's a word you don't hear very often, but uh, we loved each other. But, you know, frankly, we argued a lot. <laughs> and uh, we broke up three times. And they were big breakups. Like, I never want to see you again. But uh, as time went by, I realized that I really loved her. And as the Bible says in the Song of Solomon, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. And so I recognized that that this love was real and it was from God because it grew stronger with the passing of time. James Dobson said, and I quote, don't marry the person you think you can live with. Marry only the individual you think you can't live without. And I think that's right. And I think I have found the secret to a successful marriage. So if you've come here looking for tips or secrets, I've got one for you now. You might even write this down. A uh, secret to a successful marriage. Are you ready? Marry yourself. No, I'm serious. It worked for me. Because on my wedding day, uh, Pastor Chuck married us and he pronounced us man and wife. He said, I now pronounce that Greg and Lori are man and wife. <laughs> he got confused. It, instead of Greg and Kathy, it was Greg and Lori. See, having a... <laughs> this is a true story. And in fact, people will say to my wife all the time, Hi, Lori. You know, her name is Kathy, but they call her Lori. And that's all right. So I found the secret to a successful marriage. Marry yourself. <laughs> Greg and Lori got married. That was a joke, by the way, if you didn't understand where that was going. <laughs> You're thinking, is that true? And how is that possible? It was a joke. Obviously not a very good one. But our marriage has been tested like anyone else's. We've faced mighty storms. And uh, the most devastating storm was when our son died. Uh, many marriages don't survive that. But uh, we look to the Lord and He's gotten us through it and I might say He's getting us through it. We're certainly not over it by any stretch of the imagination. But marriages come under attack. Marriage face pressures. Marriage face, marriages face hardship. And the question is, what are you building your foundation on. Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me is wise. Like a person who builds his house on solid rock. And though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it was built on rock. 
But if anyone who hears my teaching ignores it, he's foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will fall with a mighty crash. So here's my question for you. Is your marriage built on the rock or is it on the rocks? Build it on Christ. Have you ever built a sandcastle on the beach? They're, they're so much fun to put together and then some wave comes in, whoosh, it's gone. Or some crazy two-year-old comes over and stomps on it, you know. Well, that's what happens, is to, happens to marriages that are built on sin. They will not survive, but a marriage that is built on the rock will not only survive, but it will get stronger through these things. And notice Jesus did not say, if the rains and floods come, but rather, when the rains and floods come. Into every life a little rain must fall, it's been said, and sometimes it's a light drizzle, and other times it's a mighty hurricane. But you may not know this, and I've really never shared this before, but I thought this would be a good time to reveal that I have actually been married to five different women. <laughs> Absolutely true. Maybe more. I've lost track. Uh, interestingly, you're, you, I know you think, I've lost my mind. I love this. I love this kind of tense moment I've created. Everyone's like, what? Yeah. Interestingly, have any of you figured out where I'm going with this yet? Okay, some of you are alarmed. I like to almost just linger in the awkwardness for a moment. No. And all of these women I've been married to, interestingly, all have the name Kathy, which makes it even stranger. Even more amazing is they all spell their name the same way. Because guess what? The girl I'm married to today is not the same girl I married back in 1974. And I'm not the same guy she married either. The Kathy of age 30 is not the same as the Kathy of age 18. That's how old she was when I married her. And the Kathy of age 40 is not the same as the Kathy of age 30. And I'm not the same person I was either. The point is, you change through the passing of time. Now, I'm happy to say that Every new Kathy is better than the last one. And they were all good. But to every marriage is going to go through changes. And every marriage is going to be tested. And so we want to build our foundation on Christ. The Bible says, He that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. I found that marriage halves our sorrows. It doubles our joys. And it quadruples our expenses but it's all good. Here's what it comes down to. One day when your life is over, and that day will come, there's only gonna be three things that really will seem to matter. Uh, those are faith, family, and to a lesser degree, friends. Uh, you're not gonna sit on your deathbed and fret about how much, how your business is doing or how much money you make. In fact, the only thing you may fret about is who's gonna get it when you're gone because it's going to be in your rearview mirror. You're not going to think about how many things you own. It's not going to matter much to you in that day. You're going to think about God, and you're going to think about your family. And in far too many cases, you're going to be thinking about how you did not walk with God as you should have, and you did not treat your family as you should have. So instead of waiting for that day, deal with it now. And when you make a commitment to a person to be married, you want to honor that commitment. I wish we could take the very word divorce and strike it from our vocabularies. It's brought up far too quickly, far too easily, far too casually. Listen, wedlock should be a padlock. If a marriage is miserable, the fault lies with the participants, not the institution. Now, I'm going to deal a little bit with divorce when we look at our text together. But I will say that biblical divorces are a rarity. Uh, most divorces that I've seen are, are, I can give you a lot of reasons why they came about, but it comes down to a cycle of selfishness that the couple gets them in, the self, themselves into, and they divorce. And I've also seen the regret they've had because they should have given more attention to it. And this is not just me, a pastor, saying this. Even people who are not Christians recognize this. They know the effects of divorce. I read an interesting article uh, on the Huffington Post the other day. It was written by a lady named Gigi Lavangi Grazer. She's a Hollywood screenwriter. And, uh, and she is not writing this from a Christian perspective as far as I could see. Uh, 
but she makes some really valid points. And I'm going to read a little bit of her article to you. And uh, she's very fond of the word sucks, okay? So don't be offended by that. The, understand who's writing it, what she's, hear what she's saying, all right? So here's what she writes from experience. Divorce sucks. I mean, it really sucks. Got kids? If so, don't do it. You probably have no reason to listen to me, but hey, I've lived a pretty long life by LA standards. I'm ancient. I've had many life experiences, among them two marriages. What I've learned since is that divorce lingers. It makes you feel sad when you least expect it. Divorce colors everything. Oh yeah, I did it for my kids so they could grow up with a healthy mother, a happier mother who had more time for them. But single motherhood, even with access to help, is not for sissies. Oh sure, I have more control over my children under the circumstances, but in return, I'm more strung out and overwhelmed. Here's some of her observations that she has in this article, uh, the things that she points out why you should not get a divorce. Number one, this is kind of funny, all men suck. <laughs> she says, oh yeah, all men are great and all men are annoying. All men are complicated. Do you get what I'm saying? Men are human. Weird, I know. But basically, if you hate your spouse and get divorced, you'll be trading him for a similar model. Number two, raising kids on your own sucks. But this doesn't mean you want to raise them with someone new. Divorce with children is, mathematically speaking, 180 million times worse than divorce without children. I'm sure there's a New York Times study somewhere to back me up on that. Kids are not better off with divorced parents. Then she puts in parentheses, high angry tweets from ecstatically divorced parents. Then she makes this quote, and this is a really good quote. Psychologist Judith Wallenstein conducted a 25-year study on the effects of divorce on the children involved. Her book chronicling their findings is more frightening than any TV commercial advertising an Anthony Hopkins movie. If you don't want to sleep at night, read what she says. For example, she points out children of divorce are more likely than children from intact families to drop out of school, suffer drug and alcohol problems, require psychotherapy, and get divorced themselves. And number three, she says divorce sucks because uh, bumps in the night. A single mother feels it every day. When the sun goes down, there's no one there to watch your back. I have to be a combination nursemaid and Rambo. I've not slept a full night in three years. It's hard to sleep with one eye open and a dog named Peanut being the only thing between you and your potential threat. <laughs> On the stress scale, divorce is just a tad less stressful than the death of a spouse, presumably one you liked. People don't behave well under that kind of stress. Money is tight, the kids are upset, and in the air is the odor of hatred. In the midst of our separation, our family therapist, a cancer survivor in her 60s, 60s who had been practicing for many years gave me sage advice which I was too angry or blind to accept. She said, wait until the kids are launched. Who knows? You may even find yourself in love again with your husband. She concludes, I chose not to take that advice. A big part of me wishes I had. And gets very well written. And this reminds me of a story I read. A woman, went to, a woman went to see a lawyer and she said, I want to divorce my husband. I hate him and I want to hurt him. So give me some advice. So the attorney thought about it for a moment. He says, you know, I have an idea. He says, okay, you're going to divorce the guy, right? Okay, so here's what I suggest you do. For three months, don't criticize him. In fact, in fact, speak only well of him. Build him up. Tell him how wonderful he is. Tell him how much you love him. Everything he does, something uh, does something nice, commend him for it. Tell him what a great guy he is for the next three months and after he thinks he has your confidence, then just say, I'm gonna divorce you. It'll hurt even worse. So the woman thought, that sounds good, I like that. And so that's what she did for the next three months. She affirmed her husband. She told him how much she loved him. She uh, built him up in every way that she could. And then finally the divorce attorney calls her and says, okay, let's get started. She says, oh no, we're going on our second honeymoon. See, she changed her behavior and it turned the relationship around. Having a successful marriage does not happen by accident. It's not unlike your relationship with Christ. Though you become a Christian when you put your faith in Jesus, your 
walk with the Lord is developed through daily commitment, through prayer, through Bible study, through effort on your part. The same is true of a marriage. The moment you begin to neglect a marriage, it's going to start unraveling. You have to constantly be doing everything you can to keep your marriage strong and not even for a moment take it for granted. So let's read now what Jesus said to those who had lost hope for their hurting marriages. What he says is designed to restore hope again. Here are the Lord's words for hurting marriages. Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees came to him, testing him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he that made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so the two, uh, so they're no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. You know, it's interesting how Jesus evades the question and takes them back to the God's original plan. In other words, instead of finding a way out of marriage, he points them to the way to stay married. And more importantly, he shows them how to stay married God's way. He refers them to Genesis 2. This is, of course, the story of Adam placed in the Garden of Eden. Uh, He was living a perfect life. I mean, he was living in the ultimate bachelor pad. (laughs) No worries, no responsibilities. Uh, Just enjoying all that God gave to him. He was sort of like the first landscaper. His job was to go around and tidy things up and take care of things and and just take it all in. I mean, you can't think of a more beautiful place than where Adam lived and the experience he was having. And best of all, the Lord God would show up every single day and take a walk with his boy Adam in the cool of the day. It was so perfect, but something was missing. Or to be more specific, someone was missing, but that someone had not been created yet. And so the Lord said everything was good after he created it, but then he looked at Adam and said, not good is the aloneness of man. And so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and Eve was created. You know, one thing you may have never heard was at one point, uh, Adam asked God the question, Lord, why did you make Eve so beautiful? God said, well, Adam, so you would love her. Adam said, well, Lord, why did you make Eve so soft? God said, so you would love her. God, why did you make Eve so stupid? God said, so she would love you. All the girls are getting mad at me just saying, what do you mean stupid? (laughs) Seriously, why did God bring the woman to the man? God says in Genesis 2.18, I will make a helper comparable to him from the Hebrew that can be translated someone who assists another to reach fulfillment. It's also translated someone who comes to rescue another. Eve would provide what was missing in his life. Now, Here's a big thing that we all need to know. It's like marriage 101, but I'm amazed how often people miss it. There are two operative words used here in the text by Jesus repeating what was said in Genesis that make for a successful and happy marriage. And the words are leave and cleave. If you're writing notes down, write those words down. Leave and cleave. Verse 5, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So the word cleave means to glue or to cling. So here's the idea. It's sever and bond. I, I detach from one thing and I attach to another. I depart from and adhere to. Loosen and secure. So a successful and lasting and happy marriage begins with the leaving. In effect, you are leaving all other relationships. Now let me explain what that means. The closest relationship outside of marriage is specified here, that of a son to his parents. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Now that doesn't mean that the boy is no longer a son to his mom and dad. But it means the dynamics of the relationship have now changed because he, 
as a husband and ultimately as a father is the head of a home and his now primary responsibility is not as a father, uh, or not as a son to a father or a mother, but it's more as a husband to a wife. He must still honor his parents, but a leaving must take place. And sometimes guys don't do this. You know, they want to continue to please their mother or their father. I heard a story of one single young man who wanted to get married in the worst way. So he found a really attractive girl and brought her home. His mother didn't like her. So he went out and found another girl, brought her home to meet his mom. She didn't like her either. So then he went out and found a girl that looked just like his mother. She dressed like her. She talked like her. She acted like her in every way. But then his father didn't like her. See, so. <laughs> These are the jokes, people. <laughs> For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Leaving means giving other relationships a lesser degree of importance. So, okay, so listen to this. When you get married, your best friend should be your spouse. Now you can have other friends. You don't have to abandon all your friends. No, I can't do anything ever again. I'm going to go home and hang out with my best friend, my wife. No, you can still have other relationships, but your best friend is your husband. Your best friend is your wife. Sometimes people ask, hey, can you have a a best friend that's a member of the opposite sex? Uh, Answer, no, not really. (laughs) It just doesn't work out. Get real. I mean, you're having another girl and she's your buddy or another guy, you know, girls, and and he's your good friend and you call him and you talk. No, no, no. This is problematic, okay? You have to understand that this relationship with your spouse is the most important relationship of all and it supersedes all other relationships. This is very important. For a wife and her husband... Uh, they are to be the best friend of each other. Here's a key verse that explains that. Malachi 2.13 says, The Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you've been faithless, although she is your companion and wife. Companion and wife. That's interesting. It doesn't just say she's your wife. She's your companion too. And the word companion can be translated one you're united with in thoughts, goals, plans, and efforts. Does that describe you, husbands or wives? Hey, how well do you know your spouse? Do you know what they really care about? Do you know what they like to do? Do you know what their favorite food is, their favorite color is? You know, I mean, how well do you really know one another? If you don't treat your wife as you ought to, as a husband, it actually can bring your prayer life to a screeching halt. Did you know that? Because God says in 1 Peter 3, husbands dwell with your wives and give them understanding, giving honor to the wife as a weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, so your prayers will not be hindered. Your prayers can be hindered if your marriage is out of whack. So this is, under God, your number one priority in life. And by the way, that word that is used there for dwell with her doesn't mean just live with her. Yeah, I live with my wife there. I got that covered. It's more than that. It can actually be translated, be aligned to or give maintenance to. Maintenance to. So we maintain things in life, don't we? We maintain our houses, our homes. We maintain our cars. What happens if you have a car and you never do anything for it? You don't change the oil. You don't even put oil in. Uh, it, you, you don't repair something, you know, the tire goes flat, you just keep driving, you know. And, well, your car's gonna break down. And, and the same happens with a marriage. You know, you don't maintain it, you don't care for it, and it breaks down. I'm always really impressed when I see a classic car drive by with a really old person driving it because I think that was probably their car in the beginning and they've just maintained it and it's perfection. You know, they get out there and they wax it and they care for it and they're driving it along. You know, and that's what you want your marriage to be. You don't want to trade her or him in for the new model. You want to take your marriage and turn it into a classic and stand the test of time. But a lot of us don't pay attention to this. You know, in our cars we have those Idiot lights, they're called. Little light that comes on. Usually when that comes on, it means you're really in trouble. I speak from experience. I've had them go on. The little light will go on 
time to change your oil, time for a service. You know, wouldn't it be nice if we had an idiot light in our marriage? Idiot husband. Uh, time for a date night with your wife. Idiot wife. Stop nagging your husband. Pay attention. So you need to ask yourself a question every now and then, maybe more often. Is there any relationship or pursuit I'm involved in that would put distance between me and my mate? See, I listen to my wife, and if she were to say, you know, Greg, I think you're spending too much time doing thus and so, or hanging around with this person. You know, I listen to that and continue doing what I was doing. But I listen. No, no. Uh, I'll make the changes, and the same with her. And there are things that bring stress in marriage. Maybe it's something you've gotten really excited about, something you're really passionate about, and all of a sudden it's taking you away from the home more and more. And you have to ask yourself the question, is this helping or hurting my marriage? So we are to do this. And I want you to notice that the emphasis is always to the husband. Notice that Peter said, husbands dwell with your wives with understanding. Listen to this. Husbands are to take the lead in the marriage. When Paul speaks about husbands and wives being married, he says, husbands love your wife as Christ loves the church. Husbands are to take the lead. Because if a husband is doing what he ought to be doing, I believe in most cases the wife will respond appropriately. Treat your wife like a thoroughbred and she'll never become a nag. Let her know you love her. Be the spiritual leader in your home. Be the one that initiates these things. Why do we love God right now? Why are we Christians? The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. Our love is a response to His love. And the same is true in a marriage. She will respond and do what God wants her to do if you'll do your part. So don't tell me your wife's not doing her part. I'm asking you guys, what are you doing? In so many cases, the guy's doing very little. So let's come back to what is said here. A man shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's no use leaving unless you spend a lifetime cleaving. What does it mean to cleave? It means to adhere to, or to stick, or to be attached by some strong tie. And by the way, that doesn't mean you're stuck together against your will. It means you're holding on. In fact, in the original language, it speaks of a determined effort. Think of it this way. You're climbing up the side of the cliff. Are you stuck or are you holding on? Well, it's a ladder, right? You're, you're holding on. Why? Because you want to live. That's why. And that's how you keep a marriage strong. Oh, we're stuck together. No, no, no. We're holding on to each other. I'm holding on to you. And you're holding on to me. And that's what it means to cleave. Does that describe your relationship right now? When we go to the New Testament and see the word used again, it translates out to be cemented together, to stick like glue, to be welded together so the two cannot be separated without serious damage to both. Have you ever used super glue? You know, I, I was always a really lousy model builder, but I always tried. And when I was a kid, I'd get glue all over everything. And I wasn't patient enough to let the glue dry and then paint. I'd start painting before the glue was done. So I just had a mess and those little strings of glue in your hands and what a mess. So, uh, you know, I got older and I became an adult and I bought a model and now they have super glue. I thought, this is great. Now it, I can just glue them really fast, but I didn't read the directions. And it warns you about gluing your fingers together. And I did. I glued my finger and my thumb together. So I was walking around saying, hey, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to, how are you doing? Okay, but I'm really not okay. But they're stuck, you see. Super glue. But that's the idea that's being conveyed here. It's like super glue. You are glued together. You're, you're one person. You're one flesh. And this involves constant communication. This is one of the keys to a successful marriage Constant communication. Listen, there are two times when a man doesn't understand a woman. Before marriage and after marriage. But <laughs> it's a joke, get it? Because that's all the time, see? <laughs> and this means you have to learn how to disagree agreeably. Sometimes I'll have couples come in who want to get married and they'll 
tell me all about how much they love each other. I'll say, have you guys ever had a disagreement or argument? Oh, no, we love each other too much. <laughs> He's so sweet. She's so gorgeous. You've never had an argument? No, and we never plan on having anyone. Get out of my office. <laughs> you come back into the real world. You guys are going to have lots of disagreements in life. So you better learn how to fight fair. You better learn how to disagree agreeably, how to come to a conflict, which you are going to have. How are you going to approach it? How are you going to ultimately resolve it? And it's going to require you bending and compromising, and listen to this, forgiving. Forgiving. Ruth Graham said, quote, a good marriage consists of two good forgivers. If you're not a good forgiver, you're not going to have a good marriage. You have to learn how to forgive. And then you need to affirm one another. You know? Uh, husbands, when's the last time you hugged your wife without ulterior motives? <laughs> it wasn't leading to something else. She said, honey, I love you. Or when's the last time you told your husband how much you uh, appreciated him? I heard about a couple that was having some marital problems. So they went in to see a pastor. And the pastor talked to him at great length and listened carefully. And, and then said he, he really thought he had figured out what the problem was and he stood up from behind his desk and walked around to where the wife was sitting and had her stand and he gave her a hug. And he said to the husband, this is what this woman needs once a day. Husband kind of furrowed his brow for a moment and said, okay, what time do you want me to bring her back tomorrow? <laughs> My jokes are so lame, aren't they? I believe most divorces can be averted. If we would just start with the operative principles of leaving and cleaving, it would make all the difference in the world. Because marriage is not so much finding the right person as much as it is being the right person. So you need to go into this marriage saying, how can I fulfill this person's needs? Listen to this. It's not about you. If you're going to get married so he can meet all of your needs and make you happy, or she's going to meet all of your needs and make you happy, you're going to be an unhappy married person. But if you can put the needs of your mate above your own, you can see dramatic things take place. In fact, the Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, before the wife is told to submit to her husband, that husbands and wives are to submit one to another in the fear of God. A lot of people choke on that word submit. Oh, I'm not submitting to anyone or anything. Oh, shut up. You submit all the time. You, you drive down the street and the CHP pulls up behind you. You submit real fast. You live by rules. You live by standards. You know there's people who are in authority over you in life. You have your boss. You have those who have influence on you. We all submit. There's nothing wrong with submitting. It's a good thing. And, and I'll talk at another time about what it means for a wife to submit to her husband. Let me just say this. Before we deal with that, the Bible says submit one to another in the fear of God. Okay, so husbands are to submit to wives as well as wives submitting to husbands. But maybe we need a new word instead of submit because we don't know what it means. We think submit means be a doormat, be a victim, uh, take whatever he gives, I give up all my rights. But actually the word submit uh, could be better translated to get in order under something. To get in order under something. In a military sense, it means to rank beneath or rank under. So a husband's submission to his wife does not mean that he abdicates his responsibility of leadership in the home. It means he helps her to bear her burdens. He guts underneath her to carry her cares. Here's an illustration. My wife comes home from the market and she has the car filled with groceries and I sit there and watch her as she unloads them and Ask her when dinner's going to be made. No, I go <laughs> and I help her carry things and I usually grab the heaviest things. Uh, you know, because I want to assist her. That's just a simple illustration of what this means. Now you look at her in general or look at him in general. I want to help you, see. I want to help you be the man God's called you to be. I want to help you be the woman God has called you to be. I'm your number one fan. I'm in your corner. You can depend on me. 
I'm always here for you. So knowing that makes a big difference in life. Holding each other up. We're all submitting at some point. It's putting the needs of your mate above your own. If at all possible you want to avoid divorce. Why? Well, God doesn't like divorce. Let me be more blunt. God hates it. Here's what he says in Malachi 2.18. I hate divorce, says the Lord. It's as cruel as putting on a victim's blood-stained coat, says the Lord God Almighty. So guard yourself and always be loyal to your wife. Now, some of you who are hearing me right now have been divorced and you're not feeling really happy at this moment. You're thinking, man, Greg, you're putting me under condemnation. Uh, I'm not here to do that, okay? Uh, because what's done is done. I'm sorry this has happened to you. Maybe you had biblical grounds. Maybe you did not have biblical grounds, but... I want to say to you, if, <laughs> I don't want it to happen to you again, okay? So if you're in a new marriage and you've been divorced, let's do it right this time. I believe God forgives. I believe that God gives second chances. But let's not go and repeat the behavior over and over again. Let's learn from our experiences and more importantly, learn from the Word of God. Well, despite the fact that Jesus has talked about marriage, they still want to talk about divorce. Go back to Matthew 19. They said, yeah, yeah. It's almost like they said, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. Here's what we're really asking. Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sex sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adulter adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. I want you to notice, they said, why did Moses command divorce? Jesus says, uh, he didn't command it, he permitted it. You have it wrong. Now back in these days, the attitude toward marriage was very liberal. You might be surprised to know. Divorce was widespread in Israel at this time. Consider the woman at the well. Remember her? Married and divorced five times. So it was actually quite commonplace. One liberal rabbi of the day known as Hillel said, and I quote, incompatibility of temperament was grounds for divorce. In this day, a man can divorce his wife for such trivial things as burning his meal or embarrassing him in front of his friends, or he could divorce her if a more attractive woman came along. Well, that pretty much opens up everything. Yeah, you know, honey, I love you, but this other chick's way cuter than you. Bye bye. Really? Yeah, you could do that back in this day. So they're saying, yeah, well, why did Moses command divorce? Jesus is saying, you guys have it all wrong. This is not God's order. Our modern equivalent to this thing would be irreconcilable differences. This is the one we throw down all the time. Well, our marriage didn't work out. Why? Irreconcilable differences. What were those? I don't know, but it was those. <laughs> irreconcilable differences. There's just no way we could reconcile those differences. Really? Listen, I've had irreconcilable differences with my wife for 37 years. She's neat and I'm messy. She's sometimes late. I'm usually early. She's cute and I'm fat. What are you going to do? It's irreconcilable. Oh, well, then we'll get divorced. No. We're going to work it out. We're going to flex. We're going to adapt. We're going to put the needs of each other above our own. Don't tell me irreconcilable differences. And guess what? That is not biblical grounds for divorce. Every marriage will have irreconcilable differences. Or better yet, you could just marry yourself like I did. Even then you'll probably have irreconcilable differences. So that's not an allowance given in Scripture. Here's an allowance Christ gives. Number one, verse nine. If anyone divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, he commits adultery. Now what does this mean, sexual immorality? It comes from the Greek word pornea. Guess what English word we get from that? Porn. Pornographic. It's a word that actually encompasses a lot of immoral behaviors, including uh, obviously adultery, uh, also incest, prostitution, homosexuality. Why is this such a deal breaker? Why would Jesus actually cite this saying, if this happens, 
uh, God would permit divorce for this. Well, because when you have sex with someone, you become one flesh with them, you see. Paul even said if you have sexual relations with a prostitute, a hooker, you become one flesh with her. So don't tell me it didn't mean anything or it was a one night stand. No, it means a lot to God. You can't do that. You can't treat sex that way. And when you enter into that union with that person, uh, this is a very sacred union to God. And so when you break that union with your spouse and go and have sex with someone else, you have violated something something very significant. And yes, there is a release clause given by Christ Himself if such a thing happens. Unfaithfulness is grounds for divorce. But it's not only grounds for divorce, it's also grounds for forgiveness. And I've seen a lot of marriages survive this. I know it seems devastating when your mate confesses to you they've been unfaithful. Usually they don't confess it until you find out though. Once in a while there'll be someone who'll say, yeah, I just I have a guilty conscience, but usually, you know, you get suspicious and you can tell and and there's those signs and then you discover it and they deny it at first and then they admit it and it's devastating. There's no question. But it can be forgiven. And I've heard many, many stories of those who have forgiven it and are glad that they did. And let me just say to you, gosh, this is like I've seen this so many times, it drives me crazy. But uh, girls are guys who get involved. And maybe this is a little more for girls. So I'll direct this to girls. Girls who get involved with some guy who tells you he's going to leave his wife for you, as they say in the East Coast, forget about it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You think if you're having sex with this guy who's being unfaithful to his wife, he's going to divorce his wife and marry you? First of all, why would he not repeat the behavior with you, number one? And number two, why would he marry you when he's getting it for free? If he ends up getting divorced because of your affair, he's going to find another girl, probably one that's not been doing what you've been doing because the very thing he asked for has now caused him to have no respect for you at all. So guess what? You lose twice. So don't go down that road. Uh, according to Dr. Lana Stanelli, author of a book on marital triangles. She says, of those who break up their marriage and marry someone else, 80% are sorry later. Of those who do marry their lover, which is only about 10%, 70% of them get a divorce. Of that 25 to 30% that stay married, only half of them are happy. She concludes, having an affair is an invitation to an awful lot of pain and tragedy. Yeah, absolutely. So unfaithfulness is grounds for divorce. Don't go down that road. Don't, don't even play with it in your mind. With fantasies. Oh, you know, I won't do it, but I'll just think about it. No, no. Because the first step to doing it is thinking about it. Love your wife. Love your husband. Be loyal to them. Be faithful to them. Because you go down this road, it's going to end in a lot of pain. And guess who the ultimate victims are going to be? After you pay the price, your kids are going to pay the price. And it's going to be a hard price for them to pay. Don't be so selfish. There's another reason given in Scripture where God will allow a divorce. It's in 1 Corinthians 7, 13. It says, If a woman has a husband that believes, yet he is not pleased to dwell with her, let her not uh, put him away. Uh, or let her, put, let her not put away. Uh, so, but then Paul says later, But if the unbelieving uh, departs, a brother or a sister is not under bondage. Okay, so here's what he's saying. Look, let's say you're married to a non-believer. This happens a lot of ways, and I'll deal with this at another time, but, but you marry a non-believer because maybe uh, you both were non-Christians and you got married and one of you became a Christian and all of a sudden you're married to this non-believing guy or girl. And that brings stress in the marriage. Or some of you were not patient to wait on the Lord uh, for the right guy or the right girl and you just say, I'm gonna marry this guy or marry this girl and I'm gonna lead him to the Lord, Right? That probably didn't work out so well for you, did it? And you basically disobeyed Scripture that says, don't be unequally yoked together with non-believers. But okay, now what's done is done. You're married to them. So now you're saying, yeah, well, I'm not really happy in this marriage and I met this really cute guy at church and, and you know, my husband doesn't care about the Lord and the Lord spoke to me the other day and he actually said to me, my child, dump the heathen husband <laughs> and marry the cute Christian guy, saith the Lord. I mean, it was even saith, like King James. 
God didn't say that. Because in his word, he says, if the unbelieving a believer is pleased to dwell with you, stay with them. Now your job is to try to win him or her to Christ. Okay, but let's say they leave you. In other words, they abandon you. They walk out on you. They desert you. Well, according to scripture, if that happens, you're free. You, you don't have to remain in that relationship and you're free ultimately to remarry. Now, this really doesn't happen all that often. Most marriages fail because of selfishness. You want that person to cater to you. You expect marriage to make you happy, as I already said. And most marriages fall apart because people ignore what the Bible says and do what they want to do. Every marriage is going to be challenged. C.S. Lewis put it this way, quote, People get from books the idea that if you have married the right person, you may expect to go on being in love forever. As a result, when they find they are not, they think this proves they made a mistake and are entitled to a change, not realizing that when they have changed, the glamour will presently go out of the new love just as it went out of the old one. So true. So, oh, if I marry him, it'll be great. And you get married, and it's good for a time. And then, you know, the hard work of marriage comes into play. Well, I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be hard. I didn't know, you know, he, he wouldn't do everything I wanted or she wouldn't. And so, well, I'll find someone else. And then the problems come in that one. Then it comes into the next relationship. So Lewis concludes, in this department of life, as in every other, thrills come at the beginning and do not last. But if you go through with it, the dying away of the first thrill will be compensated for by a quieter and more lasting kind of interest. End quote. Look, as you've been married for time, it's not the same as it was. I don't have butterflies in my stomach every time my wife walks in the room. You know, when I first met her, oh, I'm so nervous. I, I just, Kathy's here. What do I say to her? I don't feel that way anymore. I'm sorry. If Kathy walked in the room in the morning, hey, uh, you know, making breakfast, oh, I, I feel lightheaded, I have butterfly, <laughs> she'd think I was having a heart attack. <laughs> she'd call the paramedics. But the love we have and the place of that initial attraction is far greater. It's far deeper. It's far more significant. Sometimes you feel it. Sometimes you don't feel it. But it's a commitment. And boy, I tell you, as the months go by and then the years go by and you've honored those vows and you've stuck to them, you look back and you thank God. And you look at others who have disregarded what the Bible says and are facing the consequences. No, fairy tale weddings are not really possible. I know we've heard all those stories and, and they lived happily ever after. The better way to say it would be they lived happily even after. Even after. After what? After marriage. Because they did it God's way. So here's my closing thought. If you're single, don't rush it. Wait on the Lord. Find a godly man or woman. Priority number one. If you're married and you're having troubles, don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Ask God for help and try to save that marriage. You know, I do find it interesting that the Lord uses the analogy of a husband's love for a wife to describe his love for the church. He says, love your wife as Christ loves the church. Well, you want to talk about a tall order. But how did Christ love the church? Well, he died on the cross for us. And when did he do it? When we were his best friends? No, the Bible says, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were the enemies of God, shaking our fist in His face, saying, we don't want you, God, that's when Christ died for us, to show His love for us. And one day we realized that. We thought, man, the Lord loves me. He'll forgive me. And, and we put our faith in Him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came to this earth on a rescue mission. And He died on the cross in your place, and then He rose again from the dead and he'll come and forgive you of your sin. I don't know if you're single or if you're married. Whoever you are, whatever your state, you need God. Everybody needs Christ in their life. And I ask you in closing, is Jesus Christ living inside of you right now? You think some guy's gonna fill the deepest void of your life? You know, one day my prince will come. Get over that. 
You need the Prince of Peace to come and live in your heart, girls and guys. He's the one who will meet your deepest needs. Like that woman at the well, you know, she's married and divorced five times and was living with a guy. And Jesus points this out to her. And then he says, you know, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water I give, you'll never thirst again. And he was sort of using her pursuit of happiness with men as a metaphor for going to a well and drawing water again and again and never being satisfied. Nothing that this world offers will meet the deepest need of your life. You were made to know God. And He will come and forgive you of your sin and live in your heart. And if you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, why don't you do that right now as we close in prayer? And you can know for certain that you will go to heaven when you die. So let's all bow our heads and everyone praying if you would. Father, I thank you for your word to us. I thank you for your love for us. And I pray for every person watching this message right now. Help them to see their need for Jesus and help them to come to you and believe and be forgiven of all of their sins. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying, if you want Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that when you die you will go to heaven, if you want that void deep inside of you filled, I'm going to ask you wherever you are to stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Again, I want you to just stand up wherever you are, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer, a prayer where you will be accepting Jesus Christ into your life. Just stand up. God bless you. Stand up right now if you want Christ to come into your life. God bless you. God bless you. Stand up wherever you are. If you're watching the, this video, you stand as well, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer to accept Christ into your life. Stand up now. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. You want his forgiveness. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord and you want to come back to him again. You stand to your feet right now and I'm going to lead you in the same prayer. If you've fallen away from Christ and you need to return to him, just stand up. Let me pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else, stand up now. God bless you. Anybody else in this final moment, stand now and we're going to pray. Stand now. God bless each one of you. All right, all of you that are standing, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. This is where you're asking Jesus Christ to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this prayer out loud after me. Pray it out loud right where you're standing. Pray this if you would. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but you died on the cross and shed your blood for every sin I have ever committed. Now come into my life and forgive me of my sin. I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for loving me and accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless each one of you that prayed that prayer. God bless you, God.